in order to really grasp why we would even do something like this, I think it's really important to just touch on the issue of extent of resection and outcome. And we're not gonna get into this issue during this lecture, but I think suffice it to say, the reason why we're doing this is we're trying to expedite an aggressive extent of resection and minimize morbidity. And if you look at some of the most current documents on this subject, you'll see this is a paper that we just recently published in JAMA, which looks at in the molecular error, the fact that extent of resection is highly predictive of outcome. And so now there's a paradigm shift for high-grade tumors showing that what we want to do is when it's feasible safely, again, with cortical and subcortical mapping, that we should go beyond the enhancing area and into the non-enhancing area, the flare, especially in patients who are under 65. With regard to low-grade gliomas, we and Dr. Defoe have published much on this through the years, showing how extent of resection is critical. And once again, because these are very infiltrative diffuse lesions, you get the sense that unless you can do this safely, it's a very risky procedure to do. And, and I'm sure Hugh will talk about the concept in the low-grade gliomas, just like I talked about the concept in the high-grade gliomas of going beyond the contrast enhancing, he's shown us that a supertotal resection is critical in terms of reducing malignant transfer, transformation potential. And this is a work from Lorenzo Bello's group showing that the initial hypothesis that Dr. Dufault put forth is not only achievable, meaning a supertotal resection, but clearly indicated in achieving a radical resection for low-grade glioma. So now the stage is set. The stage is set in the sense that you realize that for us as neurosurgeons, we are now obligated to proceed with an extensive resection. The critical issue is how to do it safely. We're not going to get into so much the uh, concept of cortical mapping, but we're going to talk about subcortical mapping, which I think is the most elegant part of this process. And so in doing this, I'm going to cover some of the aspects that have to do with the motor system as well as the language pathway. So again, setting the stage for what you're going to hear, I'm just going to show you visually some of the tracks that we have to consider when we're doing this. And I like to look at this in terms of different buckets of pathways, such as the associative fibers, classically the things that we're so concerned about with the language system, like the SLF, the AF, the IFOF, the ILF. And then we look at other aspects of the motor system, principally on the bottom here, the projection fibers, such as the corona radiata and the corticospinal tract. And just to visually put this into perspective, and if any of you are more interested in learning about this. This is a really good review article that I wrote with Eddie Chang several years ago, which crystallizes the current concept of language systems that are organized more ventrally and dorsally. And although this is being challenged as we speak primarily by Dr. Defoe and his work, I think it's a basic construct for us to think about. <clears throat> so, you know, it's clear as we go into a case and we do the cortical map, we have to, within a short distance deep, once we start getting underneath the U fibers, now you have to start thinking very carefully about where the subcortical fibers are, such as the arcuate fasciculus, the SLF as it wraps around so-called uh, Wernicke's region, although we don't refer to those terms anymore, meaning Wernicke or Broca's area, but the SLF, which wraps around. And I'll show you ways in which, again, from a technical point of view, you can isolate these and map these out. You see very nicely some of the anatomical dissections that we do here in our 3D lab looking at the SLF. 
And then, of course, we have other structures of the more ventral stream, such as the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus and the ILF. You see this very characteristically represented here in its relationship to the uncinate fasciculus. Very, very important concept as you begin to move deep underneath insular tumors that you have to make sure that you're not getting into that region. And of course, there are testing paradigms that I'll show you that we can use that help us to identify those pathways very, very clearly. Obviously, as we all know, we can't see these fibers in particular. These are all special preparations that allow us to see these striations. And of course, we can't do this. So we have to see in vivo the pathway based upon our mapping of these pathways. Of course, the internal capsule, absolutely critical to understand the relationship to the Rolandic cortex and then going underneath it all the way down into the internal capsule. Another dissection here. So with that in mind, um, I think it's important to bring up a concept, and again, this is work that Hugh did, and he'll talk about this, but it's a concept that uh, I think we didn't realize early on in this process, which has to do with the difference between cortical plasticity potential and subcortical plasticity potential. And, you know, we and others have shown that when you look at the motor system, and this is an article that we recently published based upon preoperative localization with MEG or magnetic source imaging, that plasticity potential in the cortex is, is significant and that over time it can occur, especially with a slow growing mass. We see that patterns of plasticity over certain periods of time will show classic shifts in activation toward the contralateral motor cortex with ipsilateral disengagement of the same function that was seen preoperatively. So the point is that even using some of these sophisticated preoperative imaging techniques, we can see changes in functional localization, which potentially sets the stage for using these techniques to predict when we're going to see this. And you can see the shifts are occurring as we have longer follow-up periods over time. Again, pointing out what I'll show you in the subsequent slides about the time course for doing this. So this is another uh, aspect of the plasticity which has to do with the language system. And again, it points out something that we learned as we started doing this subcortical mapping that using any paradigm that we use to test, that the plasticity issues are much greater, much more likely in the cortical region than they are in the subcortical network. So the subcortical system is much more resistant to injury and thus plasticity. And so you have to be very, very careful about that concept. 